And three, two, one. Good evening, everybody. I want, on the behalf of the congregation of the Highland Park Conservative Temple, <laughs> Congregation on Cheyenne, I welcome you to our uh, health education program. Uh, a conversation between Dr. Maurice Elias and Dr. Jeffrey Kress. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to remind you that next week is Yom Yerushalayim, and we have an uh, exciting program with the Professor Jonathan Mark Ribbitz from Rutgers University, who specializes in Yerushalayim, and he's going to talk on Jerusalem, Challenges of Coexistence. So I urge you all to put that on your calendar and come. Tonight we're going to hear an exciting discussion between two of our outstanding congregants who have studied Jewish education and are recognized nationally, and they are really a treasure in our congregation. Uh, professor Maurice Elias is professor of clinical psychology and interdisciplinary health at Rutgers University and is director of the Rutgers Social Emotional Learning Lab and he's dedicated to building children's schools for facing the tests of life. Uh, he's active as a contributing faculty to the Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life, and he lectures widely in synagogues, religious schools, and other professional organizations, and he is the recipient of a Rutgers Teaching Award this year, and I'd like to congratulate Dr. Elias for that. Professor Jeffrey Kress is Associate Professor and Area Coordinator of Jewish Education at the Jewish Theological Seminary. He coordinates informal and communal ed education at the William Davidson Graduate School of Jewish Education. He's Chair of a Network for Research in Jewish Education. His, his latest book, Development, Learning, and Community, Educating for Identity in Pluralistic Jewish High Schools, won a Jewish Book Council National Book Award. So, without further ado, I want to let our two outstanding speakers have a discussion about educating our children in the age of the iPad. Um, we thought, uh, especially since we have a, a more intimate crowd, if, um, if we could just go around quickly and introduce ourselves and uh, just a quick, you know, um, name, you live here in Highland Park, uh, and since this is about education identity, um, just let us know, do kids, grandkids, uh, ages, if you have, um, and that'll let us know who we're speaking with a little bit. Uh, I'm Jeff Kress, uh, I'll introduce Adina, hi. We have uh, two kids, as some of you know, Ezra, who is 15, and Kira, who is nine, going on 19. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, I'm Maurice, and I have uh, two, two kids, but most importantly, I have a grandchild. Uh, so this is, you know, and, and <clears throat> I will tell you, just uh, apropos of the title, he was over at the house uh, on Sunday, and he promptly took my phone, uh, my iPhone, which I hardly know how to use, and he started pressing buttons on it, and within, within a couple of seconds, he was uh, watching uh, Julie Andrews uh, doing <laughs> Do Re Mi. Could have been and, worse. And my wife asked me, um, you know, what did you show? What did he? What did you show him? And I, I said, what it was? Well, can, can you can you find it? And my answer after several minutes was no. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so it, he's really uh, quite honestly uh, rekindled my interest in the, the topic that we're here to talk. about. Uh, Diane Hoffman, and I share with you the same uh, I have seven grandchildren, and the oldest is seven. So um, I'm very, very interested in, in it. It's a whole new world, so different from the one I raised uh, my children, or we raised our children. I live in Hanover. Uh, my name is Marlene Herman. I live in Edison. We have eight grandchildren ranging from one month to 15 years. And it is uh, a different world. 
than when we raised our four children. I'm a professional, Debbie Gerber. I'm a professional educator in my 45th year of teaching, and I am very interested in this for that reason. I also have three grandchildren, uh, two in Sweden and one here, and I, I, I open my, you know, my Facebook and look at their their updates, and the little one is two uh, in Sweden, and she's already watching, you know, looking at her, using the uh, equipment and using her iPad. My father and my mom. My son, her father's iPad. So uh, looking at that, you can see that they're completely different world. The three, the, the four-month-old isn't right there yet. <laughs> but the uh, six-year-old and the two-year-old are definitely there. <laughs> I'm Leah Silver. I have two daughters who are tenured professors. And I have four grandchildren, two boys, two girls, and most of all, I have a great grandchild who is Yay. super precocious, <laughs> who has already taken the cell phone and pressed the proper button and spoke to his grandmother. <laughs> uh, oh, 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 oh uh, he's a year and a half now. Oh. <laughs> I thought you were going to say that he was ten years old, so that would. <laughs> simply. Your name. My name is Norma Arbett. I'm a native of the Stadt of Bound Brook, New Jersey, where I grew up. <laughs> and as a youngster, I would say, please, Dad, please, Mom, can't we move to Highland Park? Can't we move someplace where there are Jews? Well, he named me. <laughs> My children, very beautiful children. Uh, the oldest one, Kenneth Asher, is in Israel. from Israel. And that's what began the trip of our children to Israel because wow. of that letter. Okay, so I'm Larry Zamek. I live in Piscataway and work in, indeed in Piscataway in the Bush campus of Rutgers. <laughs> uh, I did not win a teaching award this year, I'm afraid. <laughs> and I'll defer to my wife about the children. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm Mona Zamek. And uh, I'm related to this man at my right. We have two children who are procrastinators, so we have no grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> but we enjoy listening about all of you who have. <laughs> and you're also the teacher of one of my children. That's true, actually, and I enjoyed it very much. Uh, Susan Barron, I live in Highland Park. I have three grandchildren, seven-year-old twins and a 10-year-old. And um, I go up there every Wednesday. I try to help with homework, but the 10-year-old had a report to do, and he did a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Left me out of it. <laughs> uh, I'm Wendy Rosen. I live in Highland Park. We have two children. Sarah is 18, and Jonah is 13. We have three laptops, <laughs> three iPads, no, iPods, one iPad, I do feel, I feel like we are, we literally, we are really outnumbered by all the technology in our house and I feel like it's taking over our lives, so mm -hmm. here I am. The iPods are complaining about how crowded it is for all the humans in the house. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Kevin Friedman, we live in Highland Park and thank God my wife and I have run a, a three-year, a three-year-old family Can you speak louder? We can't hear you. Uh, Kevin Freeman, I live in Highland Park, and um, my wife and I have, actually I think it's a five-year-old and three. I'm Marla Zirin, I live in Highland Park. I have two married children. I have a 14-year-old. We have a lot of technology. Um, I am a, a middle school teacher for six and a half more years only, but I'm not counting. Uh, we are encouraged to use technology every second of every day, or you're not a really good teacher where I am. 
Um, and most importantly, as Maurice said, I have a, I have a five-year-old grandson who is the only one in the family with his own iPad, which he's had for over a year. And there's another grandchild on the way sometime in June. Um, so that's that. Do you want to add anything about our kids' uh, television <laughs> and uh, computer habits? Yep. Occasionally they're not on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Rabbi Rita Hoffman, and I was a congregational rabbi for many years, and was dubbed by parents who were educators as the Pied Piper Rabbi. Um, I made as my rabbinate the 614th mitzvah to be the rabbi of kids and not just their parents, mm -hmm. and um, had a pretty good success rate. Fast forward now, five or six years, and this past year I worked in an afternoon religious school, which will be unnamed. Actually, I should know that I'm speaking of a camera that's not good. Um, uh, one that has an excellent reputation, and um, it was shocking to me, really an eye-opener, um, how d different the kids are, how the culture is so different. Um, and I can't believe that this is an aberration. I don't know if it's an aberration. Um, and they're all plugged in with, you know, with their ear buds <laughs> and this, that, and the other. That in itself is a negotiation. So, what's going on? Okay. Uh, um, let's see. <laughs> okay, go ahead. More than what's going on, how do we fix this? What's the tikkun? I'm Steve Parkoff. <clears throat> My wife is sitting in the back, Barbara. And we have 10 grandchildren, ages from seven. Did I get it right? To 17. <laughs> to 17. 18. 18. <laughs> and, uh, Local grandchildren had to teach us how to use our iPhones, even though they didn't have one. They, uh, when we got ours, they taught us. Uh, they, when uh, the kids get uh, bar mitzvah in Texas, we buy them an Apple Mac, portable, and uh, everybody's online, and, it's, and we're texting like crazy. Hi, Saul Fishman, Highland Park, two daughters, ages 13 and 11. And I'm um, not so fascinated with technology since I work with it constantly anyway and take it for granted, but I am very interested in Jewish identity and how to teach it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm Rabbi Malamud, Elliot Malamud, four children, one soon to be in university, and uh, three in various stages of high school and pre high school, also teaching. In the, uh, here with the kids in the school and at camp. And um, my mother just bought an iPad for her 80th birthday. And when told that she needed to buy apps, she asked, what's an app? <laughs> and when told she could buy it at the app store, she said, where is the app store in the mall? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so we are, you know, living the digital immigration story and digital native story. Yeah, I think there's an additional category to uh, digital native and digital, uh, digital uh, refugees or whatever it is. There are uh, digital abductees who uh, <laughs> feel that they are dragged into this screaming and, uh, and kicking. So. Great. Well, welcome. Yeah. So as a sort of a, a continuation of the beginning of the conversation, so we're, we're curious, and um, when, when you all were growing up, what, would, what was considered innovative technology? What do you remember as being the innovative technology when, when you were growing up? <laughs> yeah. Me? Yeah. yeah. The cameraman. <laughs> um, transistor radios came out in the early 1960s. Uh, remote control televisions. Um, I grew up with a record player, record player. Uh, using LPs, basically. And then we saw the coming of um, cassettes, 
and eight tracks and then CDs. Um, me behind the camera, which you don't see on, on the video, um, we used to shoot movies on movie film. It then became video cassettes and now uh, digital video. And you edit on a, on a computer screen rather than on a little rewinds. So that's what I grew up with. Uh, I had my own telephone line in my own room, my dial, and it was yellow. <laughs> it was my own phone with a cord long enough so that I could talk in the closet. That was high technology. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it had a, uh, a, a privacy function. Yes. By closing yes, the door. Yeah, I read mean, jogging my memory. I was a camera buff, so I had a couple of different cameras, a Kodak, a box camera. Mm -hmm. But uh, my father was in the music industry, so we had all sorts of different radio, uh, radios and record players, and as he mentioned, we went from the uh, vinyl to the 45s to the 33s. Each one required a different, huge, non-portable, player, so that was kind of the emerging technology. Uh, for me, the greatest thing that was the dishwasher, because then my brother's in the office, and I said, wash and dry. <laughs> I thought I had a Polaroid camera. That was oh, yeah, yeah, right. Right. Mm -hmm. When that first came out, it was a new Polaroid. Was great. Fantastic. Yeah, about the 1952 Zenith television with yeah. a brown screen. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> We had, we had one of those in the Bronx. Black and white, though. Well, what else was there? <laughs> the remote control looked like this. <laughs> um, the most uh, important digital game. <laughs> Video game. <laughs> That's how I play tennis. I remember the Sony Walkman. The, yeah. the original, the, the really big, and it kind of went over your shoulder. <laughs> like a, like a, a purse. Uh, that was the evolution of music, portable music. The right. others? That's this is the contrast, you know. I mean, and when we watched that Zenith, that, you know, everybody would be in the same room mm -hmm. watching the same thing. Um, Milton Berle, right? And, and John Lawrence Welk, but we don't even talk about that. It, it stayed in the room when you left the room. <laughs> it, 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 it stayed in the room. I just have to say this. This, this week I was spent, I spent Shabbat with my son, who's a rabbi, and, and he uh, we were watching for some reason that the Lawrence Welk show came on. So we're watching a couple of minutes of Lawrence Welk. and said, "Well, tell me, what's the purpose of this show? What 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 is it? You know, I said, "What what do people watch it for?" And he just couldn't get, get his mind around it. After five minutes, he, I'm bored. I can't deal with this. He just had to get out of it. Very funny. He couldn't figure it out. What what is this? And, and TV was limited in time. It came on at a certain time and went off at midnight with the Star Spangled Banner. And it but, has to have. And it, right. So that your time was not to be glued to the television at all times. <clears throat> and you didn't have, you only had a few channels, uh, two, four, seven. Uh, yeah, right. in New York. Yeah. Do you remember the independence of the telephone? Well, you didn't have to call someone and say, hello, operator. Right. No, you <laughs> could dial your own number. Dial your own number. It's an innovation, right? So, so, yeah. My father was a member of the machine. He was always looking for something new. He came, he had the first, um, uh, in Bamberg, the first uh, television, the first television in Bamberg, New Jersey. That was what my father's yeah. deal. Now, of course, as soon as you get something, it's almost out of date when you bring it home. And so our kids want to have the latest version. Um, we, we joke about the microphone. Yeah. Um, we, we joke about the fact that our kids are hoping that version 2.0 of us comes out at some, at some point because they like a, a better one. So, so this is actually the conversation that, uh, that Jeff and I started having as we were preparing to have our conversation. Uh, we thought it would be at least as interesting. We, we emailed a few times. I don't think it was all face-to-face. <laughs> right.
We thought it'd be at least as interesting to hear from uh, from you about this, but but I will ask Jeff um, uh, about some of your reflections about what you think the change really means. Yeah. Okay. Do I need that? Yeah. Uh, I I want to reflect a little bit based on what you said and some of what Maurice and I talked about. Uh, this is not. Um, It's an interesting way, I was thinking about the title of our thing. Uh, do you have the title here? Uh, Building Jewish Values and Identity in the Age of the iPad. And when we say technology, sometimes you get kind of a groan, like, ah, oh, the age of the iPad. And sometimes you get something exciting, like, ah, oh, it's the age of the iPad. So which is it? Is it that technology is a great benefit to parents and educators and people who are bringing up kids? Or is it that technology is a great challenge to parents and educators and people who are working with kids? And I think that some of the things that you, uh, that you talked about point to the fact that technology and technological innovation has been with us always. And you know, it's like you say, if only he uses power for good. You know, if, if technology could be used for good, and technology could also be a challenge and pose um, challenges as we try to adapt and adopt new technology. Um, you know, if you go back, even uh, using uh, whiteboards in the classroom or using um, basic film projectors in a classroom, uh, these are not, you know, they're not cutting edge, but as they came into use, they brought up different challenges. Uh, how many films is too many films to show in the classroom? Do you spend a whole session showing a film or do you stop in the middle of showing a film? So um, in a way, um, it's a bit of an, an evolution. It isn't like we're the first people ever to deal with technology, but I do think there's something different. And I think it's some of the things that you pointed out. Your TV did stay at home and you put it behind you physically. Now technology is with us always. And, you know, I think it's probably hard. I admire, I haven't seen anyone do it yet, but, you know, checking under the table to see who's emailed and who's buzzing and who's texting us. There's no getting away from it now. It's everywhere and it's always. And there's been some interesting um, neuroscience research about how um, the parts of our brain that respond to um, pleasure and reward, they, they light up when these emails come in. And it uh, you know, shouldn't be surprising because it's exciting for us. What is it? What is it? Oh, it's just an ad for Macy's. Oh, what is it? What is it? Oh, you know, it's a long lost friend. It's like winning the lottery or something. So um, the, the ubiquity of it is, um, it, it's hard to ignore. And the other thing is how, it's not just what the technology is, but what the technology does. And it's kind of a cliche, but there's the idea that technology has made our world a lot smaller. We know far more about what's going on beyond our little neighborhood now, our kids do, than when we were growing up. When we were growing up, you know, we had conversations with our parents about world events. We might've seen the newspaper, Maybe you watch the nightly news, but here kids have a direct line to their camp friends who are off in, uh, off in Boston and got news of the Boston uh, bombing immediately because people posted it on Facebook and their friend, they saw it before the adults saw it. And this is how uh, the, the, the separations of time and space aren't the same. You could be sitting here but suddenly you have real-time information from someone that you know, or even someone you don't know, someone who knows someone that you know, who knows someone that you know, and is getting that feed from um, elsewhere, from, you know, Boston is just the most recent example. So I think the exposure to, um, to different people, different places, when you talk about Judaism, different ways of being Jewish, or different ways of not being Jewish are much closer 
and much more within kind of our finger clicks. Do you want to add to it? Yeah. Yeah, so, so I think that, that may be challenge number one from the point of view of Jewish identity is that um, the kids are exposed to many more models of being Jewish and they're also exposed to many more models of living that may have nothing to do with being Jewish. And so for parents who are trying to uh, send a message or build a certain case, um, it's very difficult to prevent what we were talking about, the, uh, the inexorable march of pluralism coming to our kids. And so one of the things that technology often does um, is it, it creates more work for parents and grandparents because there's just more you have to deal with. And, and Jewish identity is a very interesting thing because I think um, with, across the Jewish spectrum, there's a, um, a larger or smaller amount of attention paid to how much exposure we want our kids to have to various forms of Jewish identity and non-Jewish identity. And now it comes right at the doorstep. And there's very little that you can do about it. And this is, this is part of what, uh, what technology does. So that, that's issue number one. Our, our kids are going to see stuff um, and it doesn't really make much of a difference. Um, you know, we were thinking about the, the we, we don't have a great analogy for this, but as we were talking about before, we're just thinking of this sort of this, the, the boundary line is moving farther. And if you want to protect your kids from uh, certain kinds of Jewish ideas, you're going to have to engage in very, very extreme forms of um, restriction. And that's getting harder and harder to do in any community. So that, that becomes uh, one issue. Um, and you want to? Yeah, can yeah. you explain what you mean by extreme forms of restriction? Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want your kids. He's to, not advocating this. He's, uh, no, well, not necessarily. Yes, sir. Sorry. <laughs> but but if, you, if you want your kids to not hear about anything, well, let me, let me use an example that came I went to Israel and I was at the Ministry of Education and I had meetings there with a very sophisticated and worldly group of, uh, of uh, educators and when you leave the, the, uh, the ministry building in, in, uh, in uh, um, it's uh, Hanavia Street you, your car has to go through B'nai Brock and I never went I was never in B'nai Brock until I left this particular case and I, and I was just, again, I'm naive, but I was amazed to see that the only way they got their news was by having things plastered up on the walls, uh, basically posters. And people would gather around them, and, and that's how they would get their news. And they were trying very hard to restrict children in particular, but not only children, but particularly children, from access to any kind of electronic uh, media. So that's an example of the fact that if you really want to keep your kids from electronic media, it's going to be harder and harder uh, to do that. So. Another example that was in the news uh, about a year or so, or maybe two years ago, there was this phenomenon, did you read, if you remember, half Shabbos? Do you remember half Shabbos? What was half Shabbos? So sometime after shul, you know, you get home, you unwind. Uh, this is in the, the Orthodox community. The, um, you, you unwind, you slip upstairs, you send a few texts, and you go back and it's not considered, it's not quite the same as breaking Shabbos. So whoever it was, these, these kids, and they were, you know, they were young teens, uh, you know, early teens, they, would, they had a rationale for it. This, you know, it's not quite the same. And, and really what it came down to was a certain impulse control. And the, um, our technology, in many ways, is fighting our basic in impulse controls. And our kids have access to it that is unprecedented. Uh, and they get this information unfiltered, and they have access that's very hard to filter. If you're in a house, and there's one television with four channels, that's a, you know, there's, there's a negotiation that goes on around who's watching it when. If you're in a house where I was trying to do the math, how many places can we watch TV in our house? 
Um, you know, every computer, every tablet. Uh, so already we're up to five or six, and then we've got three television sets or two television sets. So there are, you know, most of you could come over and watch something different <laughs> in our house. Um, so, so the ability to control these things, I think, becomes very different. Also, I don't want to necessarily slam um, technology. I think we're, we're also acknowledging the fact that, you know, this could be a very, that what kids find on the internet could be very rich in terms of their own uh, kind of research into what different, um, different causes. People get involved in uh, philanthropy online, even as kids. They keep in touch with their friends. I mean, there's a lot of exciting things that are going on. Um, but the, the added screen time and this idea that there is just so much information coming at them, not always, and that's maybe to put it mildly, in support of the values that we want to, um, to pass on. They're seeing a lot of things that, um, that aren't necessarily consistent with what's going on in the home. And I think one of the issues of this kind of extreme control is that it's very hard to create an environment where we control the messages that are coming to our kids. And it was always the case. I mean, you, you know, your kids always left the house and went to school, but the nature of communities has changed. The nature of, um, of electronic communication has changed. So there's a lot more kind of coming in unfiltered. So uh, I'm going to kick this back over to Maurice um, and ask you, uh, Maurice, when you're thinking about kind of over the years when you've worked with teachers and parents and they express their concerns and what they're seeing of their, uh, of their kids, how have these things evolved? What's different now? Uh, even though technology has kind of been a part of things for a long time. So, so, so when I think about um, what's the difference now, uh, and it's been, it's been true for a while, but I think it's, uh, there's, again, it's a progression. Um, you know, I, I, I spent some time uh, as the chairperson of the uh, religious school here. And I remember we had one, uh, as the rabbi likes to refer to as a liminal moment, when we had kids who were coming in uh, to the religious school wearing their, their cleats and their soccer uniforms. And so, you know, in a sort of a naive uh, Colombo style, I, I tried to inquire, you know, how exactly is it that the, the cleats and the soccer uniforms are related to the Parsha? I, I don't get the connection. Why do you have to come to religious school based in these things? And the answer was basically that, well, they, they couldn't stay for the entire class because they had to go to practice. And so they were going to have to leave early and you know, couldn't take time to change. And, 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 and this was a, a conundrum, because we had to make a decision, really, about what was the priority. And uh, we eventually uh, discouraged that particular behavior. If you really want to go play soccer, play soccer. If you're going to be in religious school, you'll be in religious school. I um, mean, and, and again, you could have different opinions about those things. Well, I think that really now, uh, it's extended to the point where, as Jeff alluded to, uh, kids are extremely distracted uh, when they're supposed to be thinking about their education uh, because they could be texting. I mean, even in, in the university, we certainly see uh, the so-called multitasking, but as you know from the literature, you cannot multitask. You are simply not doing the task that you're not doing, and you're doing the task that you're doing. And if you alternate between them, then you're alternating very quickly. But you're not multitasking. You shouldn't delude yourself into thinking that you are. So, so this is the issue. Uh, and, and this is why the issue of the screen time um, is an issue. Because, you know, it's, it's again, it's, it's not only what you're doing when you're on the computer. It's what you're not doing. What, how else could you be using your time besides that? And so when you start to add all the email time and all the texting time and all the time, so, so what's being lost? And it turns out that one of the things that's being lost seems to be interpersonal interaction and the skills that kids actually need, uh, that they're going to need to get along in the world, uh, to get along in the job, to be part of a congregation, to be a good family member, to be a good employee, uh, to be a, a good parent or spouse or whatever. Uh, those skills are, are in short supply. And, uh, and Oliver Sacks, the, uh, the great neuro... Uh, 
psychologist, did a very interesting study of, of this. He said that he does think that the, and this is before the iPad, but he felt that the iPod was the greatest enemy to public health. And, and we're going to briefly replicate his experiment so that you can know what, what it was. So I'll just ask you a brief question, and you can just raise your hand uh, for the answer. How many of you talk to yourselves? Just raise your hand if you talk to yourself. So those of you who didn't raise your hands, uh, you either have like shoulder bursitis or you're lying because everybody talks to themselves. And what Oliver Sacks has found is that people who are deaf have auditory hallucinations. So what does that mean? That means that we are programmed as human beings to need time to reflect. And when we don't have time to reflect, that diminishes our cognitive and intellectual capabilities. So as soon as kids have free time, and of course sometimes adults, we're putting things in our ears. Time that otherwise would have been spent in reflection. And now, even aimless reflection may well be better than no reflection. I mean, we, we don't even know all the consequences of this. But that's an example of, of how um, the, the technology can take over for us. And one of the roles of parents, and even grandparents, is to keep an eye on this. And, and again, not to, forgetting what it is, the idea that we won't have our kids do quite so much of it is important. So, and that even it goes to religious instruction. Uh, if you think about the idea that, that, as Jeff said, technology can bring so much into the religious school classroom and you could get videos of things. and well, But if there isn't time for conversation, if there isn't time to learn how to share opinions, if there isn't time to learn how to relate to one another, then their religious education is not going to be uh, complete. Uh, so we have to be very careful uh, not, to, not to risk losing the interpersonal skills and opportunities for debate, discussion, dialogue, disagreement, cooperation, um, that, uh, that in many ways technology can, can usurp without our even uh, thinking about it very much. Yeah. I, I wanted to bring up a point that... Can you all hear? I wanted to talk about the fact that when you have a, a child or a grandchild using technology, sometimes it's quite tricky. So here's an example. With me, if, if when I was doing homework, if I had the TV on, or the record player, there was, or I was on the big yellow phone, my parents would know that I was not engaged in learning, okay? Well, cut now to my 15-year-old who's an excellent student and really, really responsible. But if I go into her room and I see her on the computer and I immediately say, do your homework, she's got books online, she submits papers online, she has resources online. She even, she studies Torah, you know, when she does her Torah reading, she has the clip online and the Torah and the, the tikkun online. So I could be uh, beginning to yell and she's doing what she's supposed to be doing. This is very tricky. I mean, the cell phone, the television, the music, no, but, but the, that computer has, is, is fantastic in a lot of ways and it really makes parenting even harder because you really have to snoop before you yell. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But you know, even if they're on the computer, you can't say what are you doing on the computer because they are doing what they're supposed to. And, so, and so it's think tough. of it and imagine it from, uh, from the child's perspective, what self-control is needed not to go click. I mean, it's right there. <laughs> it's not like you have to walk upstairs and hide in your closet at the end of the big yellow curly it's cube. Right. It's right there. But you can also do it so quickly, and the images go by so quickly that our attention span is now much shorter. So that even conversation time amongst people seems to be, you are cute, right? GR number eight. <laughs> So, so, you know, I, 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 I'm going to, you can copyright that, Marla. You have to snoop before you yell. I, I just think that's so, such a terrific that's great. mantra. Yes, no, absolutely. I, I, think that's, I think that's terrific. But, you know, the, the, other, the other aspect of this, um, and again, you know, we don't quite know, but we can suspect 
Uh, for example, at the university, students seem to be able to read less because their eyes are not used to doing what you have to do to read. And you know, reading is a kind of a really kind of a dull thing that your eyes have to do. But when you're checking screens and 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 doing all kinds of uh, texting and surfing and getting bits of information, uh, it's very different. And as Jeff was saying, the brain literally responds in a different way to that kind of thing. And so, um, so here again, we have to ask ourselves: Do we necessarily want all the books to be online? Do we only want our kids to do online reading? I think some of us uh, grandparents are, are probably uh, advocates for getting those old books out of the closet and making sure that, that, that kids be comfortable uh, with this uh, ancient technology of turning a page and looking at a book. Um, and it's especially important for kids who are very young because those kind of imprinting uh, of values around comfort and reading um, by the time the kids in third grade, a lot of their essential reading habits are pretty well formed. So that's why it becomes so critical to, to sort of not, not let yourself get overly swept up in, in some of these kinds of uh, technologies. It really is a lot about, uh, about the balance. Has, anybody, has there been any studies on the impact of not having the sensory experience for a kid of holding the book and turning the pages? And feeling, you know, sometimes the pictures have you know, the velvet rabbit, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, even myself, when I first moved from paper books, you know, hard books to a Kindle, I missed that sensory piece of having the texture of a book and the difference in the page and the print. So what's the impact on the kids? And have they? You know, I, I have not seen, have you seen anything on it? I haven't seen anything on it, but I, but I tell you, I think the, the issue is that if you if you never had it, it's it's different. I mean, we old folks had it, we had a lot of it, uh, and so it's different. Um, so I, I think that's that's part of it. They, what they're going to be missing, is it going to be terrible? They, they don't have the feel of the Kindle. You know, someday, someday when their kids go back to books, they'll probably say, oh, I missed that one. <laughs> it was backlit, you know. <laughs> so, so it's hard. It, that part of it's hard. It's hard to know. Um, but, but it's a different visual technology. That's the thing that, that we do know for sure. So, when should we talk a little bit about uh, education? Or we... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're, we're working at our timing, given the... We're having a conversation. It's a conversation. We're having a conversation. We'll let you in in our conversation in a minute or two, but we need to work things out here. Are you talking to yourself? Are you talking to yourself? I am. No, we're having <laughs> Amongst ourselves. Amongst ourselves. Okay. Um, so uh, we're, we're going to switch over to uh, the educational realm a little bit and to talk about um, how tech technological issues talk, uh, play out in schools or in, um, in our experience in, in Jewish education. Um, so I just uh, ask Maurice, what is your, uh, to give us a sense of your educational history, and then I'll do the same, uh, Jewish educationally? Uh, yes, my, my uh, Jewish education history um, was, um, went to uh, after school, Hebrew school in, in Queens. Uh, where I majored in uh, Chinese handball. That was my specialty. We occasionally had to interrupt that for religious instruction, but it certainly had no impact on me. Uh, and and, and uh, I did perfect the Chinese handball much more than I perfected anything that I learned actually in the, in the, in the religious school. It was, it was a very uh, Hebrew-focused um, uh, experience without a lot of understanding, and I was, I was certainly one of those looking forward to my liberation at uh, the, uh, the bar mitzvah, where the bar mitzvah represented conclusion of religious education. Uh, and so I, I was, that, that, that was my history. Until as a parent, uh, I began to see things a little differently. Um, my background's a little bit different. I went to uh, Jewish day schools through most of uh, elementary school and all of high school. And um, I would say that my reaction at the end was pretty similar, though, which is, uh, you know, get me out of here. And uh, I, I feel that I finished uh, my 
high school experience with a very good, solid foundation of Jewish knowledge, and you know, I learned a lot of Talmud, and I, I, uh, my Hebrew was really excellent, but I felt that as, um, as a conservative Jew, or someone from a conservative Jewish family who was going to Orthodox day schools for reasons that, you know, uh, if you have a couch, I can uh, <laughs> tell you all about. Um, but I'll spare you for now. Uh, I, I ended up with um, kind of a sense that I didn't know what, where my place was in the Jewish community. And uh, I tell you this, not just because it is a cheap form of therapy, uh, but also because um, what, in a way, what expanded my horizons, again, before the internet uh, showed that there are different expressions of being Jewish, what expanded my horizons was getting involved in uh, Hillel in college, and uh, around the same time, becoming more involved in camp and uh, Camp Ramah, which I came to late, and um, realizing that the world wasn't divided up into um, you know, people who were either kind of towing the yeshiva line and people who were doing something wrong, that there were people who were very serious about their Judaism and expressed it in a lot of different ways. And I'm saying that because um, it's a little bit of a, of, of a segue to talk about um, some, of the, some of what I've seen in my work in, particularly in Jewish high schools, which uh, uh, I talk about in the book here. Uh, but also that um, the authors, including Maurice and others, have written about in, uh, uh, in terms of how educational settings, and I say educational settings and not schools, because one of the, one of the trends, or how these educational settings have responded to the world of technology here. And I say educational sec uh, t uh, settings and not schools, because I think there's been a growing appreciation of camps and trips and youth groups, not just as fun and friends, although that's part of it, but also a, par a, a place where there is Jewish learning. And by Jewish learning, we mean becoming part of a Jewish community, getting the skills for prayer, getting the skills for um, the rhythm of Jewish life. And uh, so for example, in you know, teens and 20-somethings, uh, the birthright experience. Uh, the birthright is the, uh, the, the Israel trip. Uh, it's becoming a very major factor that um, it's kind of a, you know, everyone's doing it kind of thing. And that's become kind of a cultural touch point. Um, so I, I would say there are two categories. Uh, one is educators who've embraced technology and are doing some really exciting things with technology. So uh, Maurice mentioned apps, which are available at an app store, but not at the mall nearest you. Uh, there are exciting and innovative Jewish apps being created. There's uh, um, you know, an example, there's an app that I saw that's being created uh, around um, the, the Jewish life in um, kind of the Lower East Side and the village and, uh, you know, kind of the span of Manhattan that uses uh, geolocation, it, it knows where you are. Geolocation is a fancy way of saying it knows where you are. So you get a, a scavenger hunt and it says, I am this person, da da da, you'll find me here and then you, you go and it knows where you're there. When you're there, it gives you your next clue and it leads you somewhere else and you can kind of recreate um, kind of historical moments and um, you can do this in groups, and there are different roles people put on. Uh, just another one is uh, something that I've heard of uh, just recently called the Jewish Court of All Time. Have people heard of this? It's, uh, uh, people are using it. Um, users sign up, and they, they get a role of some famous Jew from at some point in history. You know, it's uh, Einstein, Moses, uh, it could be anything. And your goal is to research your character and then you come together in this virtual space and you debate and you work out some kind of topical issue, but you have to do it in your character. So as Moses, what do we say our communal response to poverty should be? 
as Einstein. You know, so, so you work that out and you can have these discussions virtually using the, um, using the perspective of uh, someone in Jewish history and you're learning about the people you're conversing with. The other, so that's one category, is kind of using technology, co-opting technology and kind of using it for, um, for, for achieving educational goals. The other really builds on what Maurice said. Um, I think there's a recognition that if we allow ourselves and our kids, the screen time could really take over. And that's in schools too. That, as Marla said, if you're not using technology, you're, you're, um, you're not doing your job. And I think that um, there are schools, and uh, there, there are, I think, in Jewish education, there's a, a counter-cultural movement with that to say there's a piece of Judaism. It's not just a piece of, um, that, like, it's a nostalgia for the past, but there's a piece of Judaism that respects community, respects face-to-face -face interaction, and respects dialogue, debate, etc. And, and schools are working on different ways of mapping, of claiming, reclaiming space. So for example, a lot of schools are um, embracing Shabbatonim. Uh, you know, a, a Saturday, they go away for Saturdays, uh, some will start on Wednesday, they'll go Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they'll go, um, they have uh, different groups will go, they'll have a drama tone, so the drama kids will go away for Shabbat together. There's, uh, you know, shira tones, so the song kids will go away together. But the idea is that there's really an active, um, a, 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 an active effort to take kids physically away to where social interaction is more natural. And, you know, often the places they go are a little bit out your cell phone reception isn't so great. So even when they're <laughs> sneaking out, uh, it's a little bit off. And what was incredible uh, to me as an observer of some of these things is um, the depth of conversations that these teams were doing. Uh, you know, people spent time at camp, they've seen that. And you say, well, they've lived together for two months and da da da. But here, even being away for two days, it's almost like they've discovered, wow, I could get like feedback from this person sitting next to me and it feels really good. I don't have to wait for them to buzz me and I don't have to interpret what they're saying. Um, there are people here who are, uh, who are interested in me, who I can talk about and I could hear them uh, as well. The other trend is, um, I'll just say a couple more words and then I'll, I'll uh, um, stop with my monologue here. But uh, another trend is, um, I just heard uh, actually on uh, NPR um, Studio 360. You ever listen to that? It was about creativity, and it was just on. Um, it was on yesterday. Actually, it's being replayed tonight. What time is it? Oh, you missed it. Um, <laughs> so unless someone is sitting with the transistor, <laughs> right? yeah. I'm always, uh, you can but, get the podcast. Oh, uh, you can get the podcast. But it was about creativity, and uh, a lot of this show has a, a number of different people weigh in from different angles. And one of the angles was um, a sense that what it means to be creative has changed over time. That you know, this person who was reminiscing about probably the times that we were reminiscing about, there were some people who were particularly creative. Each class had, there's your artist. Yeah, the rest of us, I wasn't the artist, but I could point to who the artist is. And these days, there are so, the creativity has become distributed, it's easy for everyone to be creative, and that has some really good uh, ramifications. Everyone could make that video. Everyone could create a beautiful diagram. You don't have to, um, you know, it isn't just the upper 2% of artistic ability. And, you know, that could be very empowering but it also creates a challenge because it, it kind of sets a bar for what it means to be creative and how do you ask kids to be creative. And I think schools are taking advantage of this by doing a lot of project-based work, doing a lot of um, uh, activities where kids are really empowered to uh, make their own, to kind of construct their own learning, 
They're uh, involved, for example, in youth philanthropy, where they research causes and they make decisions about how they're going to spend uh, Sadaka money. And these are used, and they're using technology, but they're using it as a tool. And I think that that becomes a really important piece of kind of instruction that it isn't let's learn how to use technology as its own sake, but let's learn how to use technology as a tool for something else. And the tool in that case would be, well, how do we use it to learn more? How do we use it for decision making? But ultimately, we make the decision about how to use our stock.com money in conversation, in a, in a, in a group um, process where we're doing that uh, face to face. So these are some of the things that I've seen that are out there. Uh, again, I think it's both using technology and its potential, but also trying to put a little bit of a stopgap on the kind of things that all of us were talking about um, in terms of the constant screen time and the constant barrage of, um, of information. What was the name of that thing where, where people play the role? Oh, the Jewish Court of All Time. The Jewish Court of All Time. Steve, this could be the, the best way to get uh, cheap way to get deceased big name speakers for the shul. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I hear one. Einstein's available, that's a real thing. Big, 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 you know? So, um, so you know, I, I want to go back to, to what Jeff said about um, the, the, the issue of identity, and I, I use the term the rhythms of Jewish life. I, I, I think that really, to me, um, almost as good as Marla's quote. Um, I, I think that's the key. Um, it's a great way of putting it, that, that Jewish identity is about helping kids find some kind of rhythm of Jewish life. And I think one of the really uh, fantastic things about this book, and this is my copy with, all, with the dog-eared pages, so if you try to pick it up and walk away with it, we'll know that it's my copy, um, is that it really shows how schools are trying to create that rhythm. and and trying to do it in a way that understands that this generation of learners is not open to just kind of sitting and being talked to, and that they need something much more experiential. And, and that, I think, is really the, the, the key. But the, the two challenges are, and, and Jeff, I want to ask you to comment about, about these both of these challenges, is one is the challenge of, um, of parents uh, trying to get kids to recreate what gave them a sense of rhythm. And the second one is the issue of sustainability. So that you go to one of these wonderful schools, you go to this wonderful camp experience, and then you go back to something else. So, so what's your sense of how the uh, rhythms of Jewish life can be captured? Yeah, those are... <laughs> the, um, I, I think that um, the, I was at a, an educa Jewish educators conference a while back, and every time someone came up with a new idea, uh, there would be a kind of a negative response of, well, how do we get the kids to dot, dot, dot? And there would always be a sense of, we've got to like get them to do what we want them to do. And I, I think that I don't know if this is a technology thing, but I think maybe the pluralism, Maurice, that you mentioned at the beginning, um, is is leading to the idea that there are there are lots of different Jewish expressions, and sometimes the way into what we want them to do is by capitalizing on what they want to do, and what they want to do might not look exactly what, like what we want to do and want them to do, but sometimes we have to find that common ground. I think it's the same as any parenting. Uh, uh, you know, we have to say what our values are. We have to kind of pick where we're making our stand, but there may be lots of different ways to kind of show what that stand is. I'll give you an example. Uh, this is a, you know, hot off the presses. I, I teach in a master's program in Jewish education. We get applicants. Um, you'd think at the seminary, uh, conservative Judaism, you'd get all these people who went to Camp Ramah and USY, we get a lot of those people. But the school where I work is, is officially 
pluralistic. Uh, you know, we, we're open to people of all backgrounds, as long as they show some serious um, engagement with Jewish community, which leads us to scratching our heads sometime. We're like, wow, I never thought of that as a serious engagement in Jewish community. Here's one. When you think about it, it's very kind of traditional. Someone whose main engagement through Jewish community is as a pickle maker. Yeah, what's in pickle maker? Here's someone who was brought up in the suburbs of Detroit and uh, has been, I don't know if you're following what's going on in Detroit, the inner city of Detroit not doing so well. So she sees that it's a mission to help down, look, the, the downtown Detroit. She's moved there with a bunch of other kind of Jewish farm pickling types and she's working with the kind of local folks on how to raise sustainable food in their backyard gardens and preserve it in pickles. And all of this to her is wrapped up in what it means to be a Jew. And she's seeing it because it's respect for the earth and uh, tikkun olam and the, it's, they have some Shabbat activities that they do. But I don't know what, if there's a shul, I don't know. But when you ask her about her Judaism, I mean, she's serious about this stuff. And she wants to, not only that, but she wants to be a Jewish educator. She wants to kind of learn more so that she could, uh, so, uh, you know, I think that, you know, again, I don't know if it's technology, I don't know where this fits with technology, other than uh, I think we, we kind of have a sense that there are a lot of different ways to live life out there and it, 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 that, that meaning could be found in different ways. The sustainability issue is, um, I think that's one that we, I think the schools struggled with, the schools that I studied, that the Shabbatonim were great, but sometimes, well, then you're right back to the kind of classic academic, uh, you know, okay, we can't really have time for those discussions now. And I think that that's kind of a growth area that, uh, um, you know, sometimes these settings seem better uh, because they, they, I mean, they are better because they have these discussions, but I think finding the continuity of the discussions um, is important. And before I see Steve is going to interrupt us, but I do, uh, I do while he interrupts us, I want to ask Maurice. Um, Maurice did some wonderful, uh, you know, Maurice was my uh, advisor in graduate school. And I, everything I've learned, I've learned from him. So I appreciate this. And one of the things I've learned most recently is from the chapter that he's, uh, contributed to this book, and it's about how um, some of the Jewish values connect to, um, or some Jewish uh, ritual and Jewish practice connect to some of the themes that we're talking about. Yeah. So maybe I see you're interrupting we're a couple minutes and then we'll throw so it out first. Just, just, I, mean, I think this is part of it. I mean, I think that the, the Jewish tradition was on to some stuff. There's no question about it. So if, if Shabbat didn't exist, uh, then some, you know, family psychologists would have had to have created it, uh, because there's a lot in the Jewish ritual life that is incredibly important for family psychological and values development. So Shabbat, you can put a lot around Shabbat, but the extraordinary emphasis now that everybody understands about families getting together. Uh, once a week at least, but at least once a week for a meal uh, that is relatively uninterrupted by technology, that's sort of a requirement, and is characterized by conversation, it is seen as a tremendously healthy thing. And what's so interesting about it is that no one really is on record as saying that you have to have three or four of those meals and it's going to be incredibly good. But if you don't have one of them a week, you, you got you got trouble. And, and I think that that's an example of the, the, the rhythm of Jewish life, that, that there's an essence there that's important. And, and that there is some ritual around that meal is also important. Does it have to involve lighting candles and saying a certain set of prayers? Not necessarily. But that there is some kind of ritual is very, very important. And, um, the, the mitzvah we have around visiting the sick. So this is another example of where this is something that is important to have in the lives of children and families. 
And it does mean that when you go to visit the sick, you are not going with your technology uh, necessarily, and in fact necessarily not going with your technology. And, and the fact that it's a very difficult thing to do. I'm sure most of us have, ha have been reluctant visitors to the sick at one time or another. Uh, but that's such an important thing for kids to learn to do, for kids to do, uh, for parents to uh, sort of make kids do. And it's not going to be a happy and warm moment. Um, it would be important if you weren't Jewish to do that. But, but Judaism has incorporated a number of things that really matter, and they tend to be, as Jeff said, they tend to be interpersonal in nature. And, and technology often is not going to usurp those things. Um, think of another example is how guests are welcome. I mean, this is a ubiquitous uh, 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 quality of human life now. The importance of welcoming is recognized in just about every culture. Um, and it doesn't involve, you know, welcoming in any other way than directly greeting another person and knowing how to do that. And, and so there's a lot in the, in the Jewish um, set of rituals that have come up that have great resonance and importance uh, even if they're not necessarily connected to all aspects of the ritual life and so when parents are trying to think about the kids Jewish identity very often it becomes important to look at the deepest level and understand what is it that we most want our kids to have part of their, uh, the rhythm of their life. And, um, and, and as, again, as Jeff alluded to earlier, it's a delicate balance to know how far to push and how far not, how far not to push. Uh, there's no specific guidelines for that, but it's just very interesting that so many of the things that, are, that, that we wouldn't want to have lost from, uh, from family and communal life just turn out to be interpersonal and dialogic and, uh, and not something that's going to be easily replaced by the iPad. There was a question I, out there. Yeah, right. I hate to interrupt you, but this is a really Loud. terrific discussion, and I can see you two are really enjoying this. Can I ask you to make a short summary statement? Like two minutes <laughs> sure. each, and then we'll open it up. Um, I would say that um, my short summary statement is that there is no linear path to Jewish identity. Um, most people's Jewish identity goes in some sort of meandering path and then arrives at some place eventually. And that's, I think, important for parents and it's even important for educators uh, because you're putting some raw material in there that life is going to lead to into some sort of combination that you're not going to be able to predict. Uh, my um, uh, sort of interest in Judaism was unpredictable from my early trajectory completely. There are a bunch of things that happen along the way uh, and, and some implanting of some uh, of, of some Jewish values, but certainly not ritual values, happened through my, uh, through my, my grandmother in particular. Um, so I, I think, I think we, we have to keep our eye on some of the, the deeper things that we value. Um, it's hard to follow up in terms of a good concise. <laughs> that, that, uh, uh, I certainly echo what, uh, what Maurice said. Uh, I would also... Um, I'd say that as a parent of kids who are kind of right in the mix of this stuff, it, it, uh, I understand that it's, it's not easy. I mean, it really is kind of a, this kind of wave force that sometimes you feel like that you're swimming against. Um, and it could sometimes feel uh, overwhelming. And I think that, um, you know, what I would conclude with is, you know, I guess, Maybe this is how I delude myself, but I'll share it with you. That you know, through all of this, as much as we say that the technology is overwhelming, um, you know, study after study shows that values come back to 
kids learning it from their parents and kids um, learning it in their communities and through all of the technological challenges and it sometimes feels like oh my god this is just like what's left for me as a parent when they have all of that um, the, this strength of, of uh, the strength of parenting and the importance of being able to um, kind of balance that taking a stand and uh, also being flexible just like with any other part of kids growing up um, you know the, the, the kind of balancing that um, that act and standing against the uh, standing against the time well I think this is terrific and, uh, I want to open it up to a few questions. Does the audience have some questions? Wendy? So, I'm trying to remember the context earlier on. And I'm trying to remember the context earlier on that you were just, you were talking about um, kids not really understanding what we understand to be interpersonal communication and the value of that. And I bump up against this all the time as a parent. Um, if one of my kids needs to contact somebody about a homework assignment or a project or something they need to, to ask them, and they're not online, I'll say, we'll just pick up the phone and call them. And they look at me like I have two heads. <laughs> and, and seriously. And so, they, you know, it's just a whole different way of of, of being with people. Um, do you have any guidance you can offer to um, get them to see that? They don't have the life experience or maturity or frame of reference to see out of this, um, of what we're in the midst of in terms of how this, their, the, their generation in particular are learning to relate to each other. And it's like their air. How do you, how do you, nurture that perspective. With our master's students, when they're in their field work and they say, I, I don't know what happened, my supervisor never emails me back, pick up the phone. I guess I could call them. Yes, you could probably call them. I, I think that um, you're right that the message is, he, here's the norm. The norm is, you wait for an email, you send an email. That's the norm they're picking up. And I think an uh, important part is doing exactly what you said, which is shifting the norm. That there are other ways of doing this. It doesn't have to be up on the soapbox. You know, it's better to uh, have an interpersonal face-to-face -face communication. But why don't you try this? Giving some suggestions. Um, talking to them about what their goal is, asking them to generate some other, uh, you know, okay, so you're not getting an email, what are some other things you might be able to, to do? And uh, they say, I'll wait till they get online. All right, well, well that's, uh, that's an option. And then, you know, what, what happens then? When do you expect them to be online next? And um, I, I do think that, um, you know, as, uh, technological refugees or abductees or whatever it is, I think that we have an important um, we have an important perspective to represent. Uh, I think we, we shouldn't be apologetic in feeling retro by recommending that they pick up uh, uh, pick up the phone. Um, so I think the, the consistency of that message is very helpful. So I, I would just go on uh, record as uh, not being as kind as Jeff. Uh, recommendations sometimes are not enough. Sometimes you have to have an embargo on the use of the text messaging function of the phone. Um, and you're perfectly within your limits to do that. There is not a, a, a God-given right for unlimited text messaging. And most phones have counters, and you could probably even see when that limit might be coming up. Or you can just have a no text Tuesday. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, you could do kind of whatever you want. The key thing is whether you think you're dealing with a skill deficit or uh, just uh, something else. And, and it can be a skill deficit because there are times when kids don't want to get out of their comfort zone. And so then they will wait. And that really is a skill deficit. So they're basically rolling the dice 
uh, and, and, and allowing uh, sort of a bad fate to be a possibility because they're not willing to put themselves out of their comfort zone and pick up the phone or you know, something like that. So you know, I, I think it's just, it's a parental choice and when recommendation, recommendation is always a good first step, but when recommendation doesn't work, I wouldn't throw my hands up. I would not be uncomfortable saying, look, this is really important. Um, if you need to get this done, and you'll need it for the future, and you may not win any popularity contest, but you're not going to win any popularity contest anyway. Right? Yeah. Uh, is, is there any data that shows, like, I mean, we know it's great sometimes for children to just go outside and, and take a ball and, and play ball outside. Um, but is there any data that shows, like, the number of hours that, that is healthy on the computer, you know what I mean, on a computer or an iPad or whatever, and then when it's diminishing returns. And then the sex, so, you know, just some sort of data on that if there's any. And then the second part is, is there any one vignette that, that you have that showed like a tremendous educational experience with a particular um, either activity on the computer or like a program or something that you would recommend an educational game? Or um. <laughs> no, I, I mean, just, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a quick, this is a vignette from last week. I mean, there, there were the programs that I talked about before, the apps and things like that. But um, I was just up in a school, a high school up in Boston do, uh, doing a visit, and it, this wasn't in, even in a particularly kind of Jewish class. It was an AP history course, and uh, using a smart board, the teacher was able to quickly move between class discussion and showing a video of um, Martin Luther King and the Freedom Riders and then talking about that and then talking about uh, Malcolm X and different approaches to civil rights and uh, you know to me that why do I tell you that vignette a because it happened last week and I have trouble remembering anything that happened before last week but also um, because to me it was a really good example of how technology could the technology was there in the service of the discussion and in the service of the thinking and didn't become the centerpiece and you know it, yes the same thing could have been done 20 years ago with film strips but it would have been bulky etc but here, the you know, with a little, <laughs> the, the teacher was able to to do that. And, and as far as the data go, it, it there are folks who have written about this, so you could you know you could Google it more accurately than I can remember it. But I think the the key thing is the it's not the absolute amount of time; it's what else is happening. So part of the problem is that if your schools are requiring homework to be done on the computer then you really can't uh, sort of just restrict computer time because a certain amount of time is, is just going to be required and that's just the way the school works. Um, then I think it's up to you to think about the recreational use of the computer in your house and like anything else, uh, television time. I mean, just forget the computer for a minute. Uh, kids are not entitled to unlimited television time. They may want it, but they're not entitled to it. So, as a parent, these are, this is where I think Jeff said earlier, technology continues to make, make more things for us to have to deal with, but that's, what, that's kind of what we have to do. The, the larger issues of computers being used in, uh, for educational purposes, um, that, there's not a lot to do about that, unfortunately. Okay, I think we're running out of time. One more question. One more question. Well, I want to thank Dr. Elias and Dr. Kress for a wonderful discussion uh, of a very topical and sensitive issue. So thank you very much. Great to be here in Hyland Park. <laughs> I see you have extra books. Uh, yeah, yeah, if anyone wants to uh, adopt wants a book? copy. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thanks so much.